for the uh, intro. Um, so today my talk is about um, some of the new uh, virtualization-based security features that are enabled by default on Windows 11. Really cool technology, probably my favorite feature within the Windows OS. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get into it. So my name is Connor. I'm a software engineer at CrowdStrike. I just like tinkering with low-level stuff, uh, low-level operating system, internals, C assembly, etc. So basically today we'll talk about um, kind of what Windows exploitation right now looks like. Um, we'll talk about the security features um, and how they affect exploitation essentially. So that will go ahead and get into the um, overview. So essentially today attackers, um, they have a few different options when it comes to taking advantage of memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, so attackers currently prefer to exploit vulnerabilities um, by leveraging a payload like shellcode, uh, which we can also refer to as unsigned code execution. Um, it's very extensible. Uh, it allows you to, in shellcode, just a blob, set up function arguments, um, call into malicious functions, um, and it's a path of least resistance. Normally, if you've analyzed any kind of exploit um, as a proof of concept, you'll see shellcode detonation. So, with that being said, on most modern um, operating systems um, today, um, initial access targets, such as like web browsers, they're sandboxed, right? So, uh, exploits today are chained together with multiple exploits. Um, so, usually what happens is a browser vulnerability is taken advantage of that gives the attacker execution in context of a browser process, for instance. Well, that's sandboxed uh, these days. So you have to pair that with some other exploit that breaks you out of that sandbox. Otherwise, you can't do things, you know, like um, write files to certain directories, etc. And usually, the Windows kernel, um, since it's native, obviously, um, it's a target for attackers um, to escape sandboxes, and kind of what we'll be focusing on today. So on our operating systems today, uh, memory is not completely read-write execute everywhere, thank goodness. Um, essentially, this forces attackers to take a three-step approach. So what happens is attackers today usually start by writing a final payload to some writable part of memory. Um, well, as I said, memory is not fully executable and writable and readable. So usually that memory that's writable where they can place the shellcode is not executable. So then they use some kind of first stage payload to mark that region of shellcode as executable. And now with executable memory, um, they hijack control flow of a program. So they figure out how do I force this exploit target to call into my now executable shellcode. Um, so, since we're talking more about the uh, kernel side of things, this is kind of how this looks at a high level um, at this three-step approach. So, if we see the memory address uh, in red in the middle of the screen, it's FFFFF780 sign extended. Um, we can see some assembly instructions which represent shellcode. And we see this acronym at the bottom, it's called PTE, it stands for Page Table Entry. That describes the memory, essentially. Um, and right now, this has a K, which stands for, it's a kernel mode address or page, and it's writable for W and V for valid, right? So an attacker, they've done that first step in that three-prong approach we've talked about, and they've written shellcode somewhere. Using a vulnerability or a first stage payload, um, an attacker can locate in the kernel the page table entry, which corresponds to the shellcode address, and then they can corrupt the metadata. So anytime the CPU goes to um, execute or interpret this memory address, it now looks at how it's described, and it says it's kernel mode for K still. Now it's executable for E, as we can see, and it's valid. So now we have shellcode in the kernel that's kernel mode, writable, and executable. So then the last thing an attacker will do is the um, hijacking of control flow. So on the right or on the right hand side, we have an array of function pointers. Um, obviously, as the name infers, points to a function to be executed. An attacker can locate those, overwrite a, a pointer with their own memory address. In this case, it's the address of the shellcode, which we previously wrote. And now, anytime this function pointer is executed, what's going to execute? The now executable uh, kernel shellcode. So that's kind of the approach attackers take uh, currently. Uh, this, in the uh, user mode, we're talking about kernel mode, but in user mode, this kind of approach is mitigated with a mitigation known as arbitrary code guard when it's enabled. Um, basically, arbitrary code guard is a user mode mitigation that enforces this principle of write, XOR, execute. 
So memory can either be writable or executable, but never both at the same time. And as we saw in our example, our shellcode was first writable, then we used some kind of vulnerability to make it executable, and that violates the basic tenet of ACG. Um, but ACG is a user mode mitigation, right? So we can put the mitigation itself, the infrastructure, in the kernel because there's a security boundary, right? User mode can't just arbitrarily access kernel mode. Um, so an attacker first needs some kind of kernel vulnerability in order to like disable the mitigation, um, et cetera, right? So there's a security boundary that an attacker already has to have some kind of kernel level access, right? Well, we're talking about kernel exploitation, right? If we assume that that's the most privileged entity of the OS, if we put a mitigation in the kernel to enforce write, to or execute, but our threat model is we're trying to stop kernel attacks, well, the kernel can't defend against itself, right? Um, so currently, Windows didn't have a way to defend against these sort of attacks, but we'll kind of talk about how the hypervisor now becomes a higher security boundary and how that's leveraged to implement these principles which we've talked about. Um, so now we'll get into Hyper-V, virtualization-based security, and another acronym called HVCI, which we'll talk about shortly. So virtualization-based security is a suite of security features that basically are provided by the Hyper-V hypervisor, which is Microsoft's hypervisor. Um, so obviously, if we're investigating VBS, it, uh, and it relies on Hyper-V, if we want to uh, look at it further, we need to see how Hyper-V works. So this is a 101, I guess. Um, Hyper-V uses this concept of partitions for virtualization purposes, right? So when the root, or excuse me, when the operating system boots, uh, that's called the root partition, essentially. Uh, and it takes up the whole physical address space um, of the um, computer. And then any time a virtual machine is created, what's, uh, what gets created is a child partition which hosts all the infrastructure for the VM. You can refer to it as an instance of a VM, essentially. And as I mentioned, the root partition takes up the physical address space, and then any time a child partition is allocated, it takes or is allocated from that root partition. And here's a uh, brief example uh, from the Microsoft website uh, from the MSRC um, blog that kind of just shows how this looks, right? So in this example, we only have one VM running, which takes up a, a child partition. We have a root partition, and they both run on top of the Hyper-V hypervisor. So a child partition allocates from the root partition. So we can infer that a child partition has its own physical address space, essentially. And it's isolated from other child partitions and the root partition. Well, how does this isolation work, right? Um, on modern CPUs, there's a technology called second uh, layer or second level address translation. Um, and Intel processors, their implementation is known as extended page tables. And what SLAT does, it basically allows the CPU to intercept memory access, right? Um, so VMs, they kind of don't know that they're not the only OS running on a machine, so they just act on memory as if, you know, they're the only OS. And behind the scenes, a higher entity, the CPU, can kind of facilitate um, making sure VMs access the memory they need to. So here's a quick example um, of this. I'll kind of draw on the screen uh, for a second. Um, but basically what happens is we have a child partition, as we can see, in, outlined in the red on the right-hand side, and then we have the physical uh, memory on the computer, right? So the child partition, for instance, over here, like at 0x2000, for instance, uh, the OS, or the, the uh, VM, excuse me, uh, it's like an OS, right? So it's just running, it's running Windows, let's say, and it needs to access the memory address 0x2000, right? Well, it doesn't know it's a VM. So 0x2000 actually exists at 0x5000 on the physical computer, right? But the VMs don't know about that. So there needs to be some sort of entity that can say, hey, I see you're accessing 0x2000 memory address. What you actually need to access is 0x5000 in uh, the physical memory on the computer. Um, so that is how that sort of um, uh, works in that regard. So the way this works is um, extended page table referring to that SLAT um, technology we talked about. As the name infers, there's an additional set of page tables. And those page tables contain all of the necessary information to perform that translation from what the guest or the VM thinks it's accessing into the actual memory on the host. So what happens is, 
Virtual machines don't actually access physical addresses. They access what we would call guest physical addresses, which would be that Xerox 2000 um, address. That gets intercepted by the CPU and then translated into a system physical address or the actual physical memory on your computer. And each VM is associated with a set of page tables, right? So you can think of like an entry in like a dictionary, for instance, that contains all the necessary information for all the VMs running um, to perform that translation. So here's kind of another diagram of how this looks like. So on the left-hand side, we see a child partition. Um, it operates just like a normal operating system, right? Modern OSs, they use virtual memory. That virtual memory gets translated into physical memory. So we just run, we act like nothing's happening, we're the only OS running, right? So the VM goes to access some memory. Well, that memory, as we know, doesn't actually exist um, on the actual host operating system, right? Xerox 2000 in the VM doesn't exist at Xerox 2000 on the host. So once the uh, VM goes to access that address, that can be intercepted, as we see with the arrow, and gets converted into the actual memory that the VM needs to access. And the way this is done is each VM is associated with a virtual machine control structure, or VMCS, and it contains a pointer to the page tables that correspond to each VM. So as I mentioned, each VM has a VMCS structure, and each VM also has a set of page tables that contains that necessary information. So now that we've talked a little bit about the virtual, virtualization infrastructure, um, we can kind of get back to VBS. So VBS just uses these same principles that we talked about, right? Um, and it can isolate memory, basically how we can isolate VMs. VMs can only access the memory inside of their VM, and the CPU is responsible for fetching the actual physical memory. Well, we can kind of use these same principles. But instead of creating virtual machines and child partitions, we split up the OS currently into two virtual trust levels, or VTLs. So here's how this looks like. Um, if you've ever read the um, book Windows Internals or heard of it, uh, the seventh edition part one, this is taken from there. And basically your typical user mode and kernel mode, what you operate, what you interface with when you boot your computer, is located in VTL zero. Um, and that's what we call the normal world, basically. And now there is a higher entity called VTL1, uh, which contains the secure kernel. So basically, this may seem a little confusing, but just imagine we can kind of treat VTL0, where we infer that you know malicious attackers are, we can treat that as a VM, basically. So as we saw earlier, the CPU can kind of gate memory access by intercepting uh, the VM uh, memory access. We can kind of use those same principles to gate memory access from there. So VTL is basically a VM, but it doesn't have like a virtual hard disk, networking, any of that infrastructure. Um, and the hypervisor basically isolates the OS, as I mentioned, um, into VTLs. And those VTLs, just like VMs, they can't access each other. Um, and this is actually what allows hypervisor protected code integrity, which is the main mitigation we'll talk about, um, to work. And HVCI basically is a, a mitigation that falls under the purview of virtualization-based security. So we can think of VBS as this umbrella. It has all of these cool mitigations like Credential Guard, if you've ever heard of that. Um, HVCI is one of those that falls under uh, Device Guard, essentially, which is part of that. And HVCI is the answer to our question earlier, so we've kind of gone full circle here. How do we block unsigned code execution in the kernel if the kernel is the highest entity, right? Again, the kernel can't have a mitigation that's defending against an attack that's already in the kernel. You can compromise the integrity of that mitigation if you're inferring or assuming an attacker has access there already. So how does this work? Well, we now have the hypervisor. Uh, we have a higher entity than the kernel. So when VBS is enabled, both VTL0 and VTL1 are placed in the root partition. So as we talked about earlier, your computer boots and the root partition takes up the physical address space. Well, the, uh, a VM allocates from that root partition. Now we kind of shove both of those VTLs into the root partition. And well, you may be thinking, like, what's the benefit of that? Why do we need all that translation we talked about earlier? Well, since VTL0 and VTL1 theoretically reside in the same address space, um, the extended page tables, we don't need to really use them. I mean, in some cases they are, but we don't really need to use them for translation purposes, right? We're, we're already in the same address space. 
Um, so what they're actually used for now is to create an additional set of page tables with an additional set of permissions. And those permissions are managed by the hypervisor, so they can't be touched by the kernel. And so what happens is, these extended page tables are configured by VTL1, which as we saw earlier was the secure kernel. So this is the trusted entity in the Windows OS. And what happens is that the VTL1 can configure memory permissions how it sees fit. So we can say, hey, this memory shouldn't be accessible by the kernel. This memory should only be writable. And it basically uh, creates those and they're managed by the hypervisor, right? Um, so when VTL1 creates these permissions, they're stored as in the hypervisor, and that's a higher security boundary than the kernel, so the kernel can't directly compromise that, and we'll kind of show an example here. So in this example, we saw a familiar acronym of PTE, or page table entry. Right now, we describe this page as readable and writable, and we also have an extended page table entry, which is the hypervisor's kind of view of the memory, essentially, and it also says readable and writable. Well, now let's assume an attacker can use that same vulnerability to locate the page table entry, which is basically the metadata that describes that memory, and we say, hey, we're going to uh, corrupt this an attacker. We can locate it because it's stored in the kernel, and we're going to corrupt it to make it executable, right? So the kernel thinks this page is writable, readable, and executable, but the hypervisor actually says, no, it's not. It's readable and it's writable. So what happens is, when the attacker goes to execute this page now, they think it's executable, but actually it's not because the hypervisor says otherwise. Remember, VTL1 can configure the permissions how it sees fit, and then it's immutable after that from the kernel. So in this case, an attacker will crash, and you're not actually able to create executable memory. Um, so you may be thinking, like, there probably has to be some legitimate interface in order for the page table entries, which are a traditional way of accessing memory. Um, or describing memory, excuse me. And there is, it's called a hypercall, which is similar to a syscall, which we're not gonna get into in this talk, but there does exist a legitimate interface to do that. So as I mentioned, this is done by using the same concept we talked about earlier as when a VM goes to access memory, the CPU can intercept that, right, and perform the translation to access the actual memory under the hood. Well, we can use the same principle to treat VTL0, where the normal people live, or like your typical everyday users. We can treat them as a VM, essentially. And any time they go to access memory, well, not every time, but uh, let's say that they go to access some um, executable memory, for instance. We can validate that through the hypervisor and say, hey, I see you're going to access some um, readable, writable, executable memory. Does a hypervisor actually say that that memory is readable, writable, executable? And if it doesn't, we can mitigate it, essentially, or, uh, or not let the execution occur. So here's the summary, basically. Um, VTL1 can set up the proper permissions of what memory should be, and it's immutable in context of the kernel. The way it does this is through the extended page tables, and those are managed by the hypervisor. And the hypervisor, again, is immutable in context of the kernel. So an attacker, even with a kernel mode vulnerability that we showed earlier, cannot just arbitrarily access the extended page tables, which actually contain what we would call the ground truth for how memory should be defined. So now that we know all of that information, let's kind of get into how exploitation changes with HVCI. So, so far we've talked about HVCI being used for enforcing immutable permissions, but we've talked about those of executable or non-executable on a page. Well, HVCI actually can be used for uh, 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 gating additional sensitive items in memory, such as the um, kernel control flow guard bitmap. What is KCFG? KCFG is the kernel mode implementation of CFG, control flow guard. And if you're not familiar, what this is, is it's a mitigation basically that validates anytime an indirect function call happens. So any call that happens through like a call register or a call function pointer, a bitmap is created at compile time of all of the known valid call targets essentially. All of the functions we can expect to call. And every time an indirect call happens, that gets inspected and it says, hey, is this function pointer, do I know about it? Does it exist in the bitmap? If it doesn't, well, it must be malicious because we didn't know about it at compile time and we crashed the process, right? Earlier, how did our exploitation work? 
we, we can make readable, writable, executable memory all day long, but we need some way to execute it. So what we did was we found a function pointer, we overwrote it, and the next time that function pointer is called, it calls into our malicious shellcode, right? Well, what do we have to do? We had to overwrite a function pointer. What does kernel control flow guard inspect? Function pointer calls, right? So we're not able to do this anymore. But again, uh, kernel control flow guard has this bitmap or this dictionary of all the known call targets, right? But we run into the same conundrum where KCFG is preventing against kernel control flow hijacking, right? So we assume the attacker has access to the kernel, right? Well, if we implement the infrastructure for the mitigation in the kernel, and we assume that the attacker already has access to the kernel, again, the kernel is trying to defend against itself. We need some higher entity, some higher um, privilege, right? That would render control flow guard uh, useless because we could corrupt the bitmap before we um, hijack control flow, right? We have kernel mode read and write. We can just corrupt that bitmap to say, hey, all memory is a valid call target, and then we've rendered it useless, right? Well, since we have a higher security boundary, HVCI basically can say on the extended page table entry that corresponds to that bitmap, it can say actually, no, the bitmap is read only and the kernel can't touch it at that point. So in this example, um, in the bottom, at the uh, bottom of the screenshot, it says memory access error when we try to overwrite the guard uh, I call bitmap, which is the symbol that corresponds to the bitmap, right? So even in the debugger, when we use EP, which basically edits memory, we can't do it because the hypervisor says this page is read only. Even though the page table entry on the right hand side says it's K, kernel, and W, write, we can't do that because PTEs are the kernel's view of memory, not the hypervisor's. So now that we've kind of talked about all this, here's where we stand. Oh, and another interesting thing I want to talk about for a second, this is the same thing that Credential Guard uses if you're familiar with this, right? So Credential Guard can do this same thing, and it basically can say, hey, these secrets, like an LSAS, for instance, that attackers can dump, we can actually mark those pages as not valid um, in the kernel and make them hypervisor-only pages, for instance. And you can't even map the memory into the kernel. So Credential Guard uses this same kind of infrastructure, which probably more people are familiar with at the enterprise level. So here's what we can, here's where HPCI uh, puts us, the boat we're in essentially. We can gladly write to writable memory all day long with our shell code, but we can never make it executable. Why? Because we can't corrupt the, the metadata to say, hey, CPU, we trick it to say, hey, this is actually executable. Well, that's managed by the hypervisor. We can't access the hypervisor. Even if we could make executable memory though, Control flow guard in the kernel is going to inspect any time any uh, function pointer hijacking occurs. Well, even if we have executable memory, we need to execute it somehow. We need the target, we need the kernel to somehow execute this memory. Well, we can't overwrite any memory essentially with a function pointer to trick the kernel into executing. So essentially, uh, we can't execute shellcode or unsigned code. That's not possible. But if we kind of get more meta, I guess, with it, as, as you could say, what does shellcode actually do? Um, so shellcode, basically, if we think of like a C2 framework, like Cobalt Strike, for instance, right? It has some shellcode that calls malicious Windows APIs to open up connections, read files, download files, etc. These are all documented um, functions in, in Windows, essentially. Uh, C2's just abuse them, essentially. Like in the last talk we heard, um, there weren't really any vulnerabilities, but we abuse tools in ways that they weren't intended. That's what C2's do. So if a C2, they only use shellcode to call Windows APIs, basically, to do things, what if we could come up with some HVCI compliant way to call uh, Windows APIs, which is what shellcode is used for anyway, but without using shellcode? That's great, but the main issue is how do we gain execution, right? Well, kernel control flow guard has a limitation. It only inspects calls and jumps, essentially. Are there, we can think, though, are there other ways to transfer control flow in a program? Well, if, if you're familiar with assembly a little bit, what happens anytime you do a call? There's usually a return, right, which returns back to the function that called it. Well, that is a control flow transfer. A return address gets pushed onto the stack, and that eventually is used to know where to return execution back. So what if we could somehow leak a kernel mode stack, locate a return address, and override it, 
and do the same thing as function pointer overriding, but do it on a return address because, again, kernel control flow guard doesn't expect those. Well, that's perfect because there's an undocumented Windows API called NT Query System Information that can be called from user mode by a medium integrity process, which if you launch a process on Windows, by default, this is normally what it's uh, launched as, that allows you to leak a kernel mode K thread object for a given thread. So what we can do basically is we can create our own thread calling create thread from user mode, perfectly documented function. We can create it in a, in a suspended state and kind of call it a dummy thread. And then we can call NT query system information from user mode that allows us to retrieve the kernel mode thread object associated with that thread. And you may be thinking, this doesn't make sense. Like, there's a user mode thread. Why, how are you able to get something from the kernel? Well, all threads are actually kernel mode objects. Even if you have a user mode thread, it's still represented as a kernel mode object, right? If all threads were managed in user mode, all users are in user mode, and they can compromise the integrity of all those threads, right? So all the metadata, all the structures, all the infrastructure, for the most part, is located in the kernel. So what we can do is we can leak the k-thread object associated with a thread we can control. And if we look on the right-hand side of the screen, a k-thread object is a structure, essentially, that has two members, stack limit and stack base. That's the beginning and the end of the stack. So basically, we can leak a kernel mode thread, and we can leak the stack from that kernel mode thread by calling a documented API in user mode. So when this happens, we can inspect all the return addresses on the stack, which I mentioned earlier, which is what we're interested in. And we need to pick one of these to overwrite, essentially. So we can kind of think of these as function pointers, but they're really return addresses. We, over we can overwrite one of them with our own memory, and when that return address goes to get executed, what will it do? It'll transfer execution to our controlled memory, right? So in this case, we're gonna use the KI APC interrupt um, uh, address on the stack, which is located in the middle. And I'm not going to get into APCs because this is not an APCs internals talk, and to be quite frank, um, you can read more about it elsewhere. But basically an APC is an, an asynchronous procedure call. And a suspended thread, which is what we did with the thread we can tr control, right? We create it in a suspended state. Anytime that happens, there's an APC that's queued to that thread and basically tells the thread to do nothing, which is why the thread is able to sleep, essentially, or stay put. And what this actually does, it puts the thread in a wait state for an object, basically, um, and it looks at the suspend count, right? So anytime the suspend count is zero, that indicates the thread can be resumed, right? So if we create a thread that's suspended, that puts the suspend count at one. That makes total sense, right? If the suspend count is one, that means this thread is suspended. And to decrement it down to zero, we call resume thread. So pretty straightforward, right? Make a thread that's um, in a suspended state, we can resume it with the uh, API resume thread, which is callable from user mode. And an APC, basically, it, it's like a thread in that it can execute code, but it's not a thread. It's used to execute code in context of a particular thread. So the reason I talk about this, like what the heck is this for? Um, basically, anytime we create a suspended thread, we know that an APC is going to be queued to that thread to tell that thread, hey, don't do anything, wait, right? Well, the way APCs are queued or issued is through a kind of software interrupt. So we can infer that when we make a suspended thread, the KI APC interrupt, which is a function basically used to dispatch this, that return address should be present because that function needs to be called, right? So long story short, suspended thread is going to have a return address in its kernel mode stack for KI APC interrupt. So we know that a reliable thread we can always overwrite. Well, since we've leaked the stack, we can use a kernel mode read vulnerability to locate that return address on the stack. So basically, we have the start and the end of the stack from leaking the kthread object. We can scan the stack, look for our return address that we're interested in, and overwrite it. And we can resume execution through resume thread. So right now, the thread is suspended. We locate the return address. We overwrite it. Then when we go to resume the thread, eventually that return address will get executed and we'll control execution. So I haven't used a lot of diagrams up until now, but here's kind of what this looks like, essentially. So if we look on the top, we can see that using a kernel mode read vulnerability, 
we can scan the stack and we can find the stack address that contains our target return address, right? The return address is gonna be used to return a uh, control flow somewhere else in memory. And then if we look at the bottom, we've overwritten it with a dummy value of 41, 41, 41, 41. Uh, if you're familiar with any kind of binary exploitation, that's kind of the de facto, what we use to validate or use a proof of concept. So in this case, we get an access violation because when the return instruction happens, as we can see at the top, what are we trying to return to? The ret adder is 41, 41, 41, 41. That's not a valid memory address, so we crash. Thus proving we can control the return address and where we call to. So we can control the hijacking of control flow, or excuse me, we can hijack control flow to control where the kernel is going to execute code from now, basically. We can force the kernel to execute anywhere in memory. But remember, we can't execute our own code. We can't create dynamic executable code because of HVCI. So what we do is we can mimic shellcode behavior using an exploitation technique known as ROP, or return-oriented programming. Um, so we'll talk about ROP here now. Basically, we saw we can corrupt a return address on the stack, correct? We can corrupt a return address, the, the uh, kernel will execute that return address, and we're all hunky-dory. We can control execution, right? Well, what if we could flood the stack with a bunch of fake return addresses? So every time those return addresses are executed, we can control what those are, right? That's known as a ROP gadget, because each one of those return addresses, um, they basically contain some kind of interest, interesting sequence of instructions that end in a return instruction. And we can chain those together in what's known as a ROP chain to call into a Windows API, just like shellcode does, which is the whole point of what we're trying to do. A C2, for instance, calls open process to get a handle to a process to read some of its memory, for instance. That's done through a legitimate interface, the Windows API. Well, that's what shellcode is normally used for, but we can't do that, so we need some other way to go about it. So here's an example of ROP chain, basically. So on the left-hand side, we have the stack, essentially. And we flood the return, we flood the stack with return addresses from the text section of a portable executable and executable, or the kernel, for instance, right? Why do we do this? The text section is what contains all of the executable code for a given application or the kernel, right? So basically, we can reuse memory that's already executable that ends in a return. Well, why do we do this? What a return actually does is it takes the stack pointer and it loads it into the instruction pointer, which is what is executing the next instruction, basically. So if we can control the stack, we basically can use a code snippet to execute some code, a ROP gadget, let's say move RIX, RBX, that does some action, ends in a return. What does that return do? It goes to the stack and it picks up the next ROP gadget to execute. Why? Takes the stack pointer, puts it in the instruction pointer. So as you can see, each one of our ROP gadgets naturally will execute the next one. And what we've done in our example is we've called into a malicious, well, it's not a malicious function, it's a documented Windows API located in kernel base, which basically is most of the functionality that kernel 32 used to be. And we can use fake return addresses to set up the correct function arguments to call into that function and change the permissions to memory, for instance. So that's an example of what a ROP chain can be used for. We basically can call Windows APIs using pure return addresses. So let's look at, at an example of this. Like, why would we want to do this? What can an attacker do with this, right? So if you're familiar with micro, or excuse me, Windows Defender, the anti-malware uh, service process is known as msmpeng.exe, and it actually can't be terminated from user mode. It's what's known as a protected process light, or a PPL, if you're familiar with it. Again, this is not a PPL internals talk. There's much better uh, material than I could ever give on this. But basically what a PPL, it's a special kind of process, in this case an anti-malware process, that prevents other user mode um, applications or processes from tampering with it, for instance. So if you want to terminate a process on Windows, this would be a good one to terminate. You can't do this even with a user mode handle as an administrator. So the way you talk with processes on Windows and user mode is through a handle, which is basically an intermediary object that can communicate on behalf of you in certain uh, capacities to a kernel mode object. 
Um, so we can't even, even if we're an administrator, we can't get a handle to this process with the necessary permissions to terminate it. But we have a kernel vulnerability, for instance. So what we can do is we can get kernel level access to terminate a PPL. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not possible even with administrative access with, in user mode, even with, you need some other vulnerability essentially. So we need to get our handle to this process from the kernel. And we can accomplish this using our exploit primitive to arbitrarily invoke any kernel mode API. Historically, we would have done this in the form of shell code, as we saw earlier. We would have called open process or something in the kernel, well, ZW open process, obtained a handle, and it would have been that easy. But we can't do that anymore because we can't create dynamically executable code in the kernel. The hypervisor prevents us from doing so. So we saw an example ROP chain earlier. This one may be kind of hard to see. Uh, but basically, this, using pure return addresses, can call ZW open process, which is a way to get a handle to a process. So basically what we would do is we would use that same primitive to locate a return address, flood it with a bunch of fake return addresses to call ZW open process and get a handle, right? Well, after we execute those ROP gadgets, we've completely corrupted or smashed the stack. Um, it, 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 all, all of the information on the stack, right, those return addresses, that's not just there for no reason. Those are legitimate return addresses that are need to return execution to a given part of the kernel in, in, so we don't crash essentially, right? If you call a function and it, it, it infers, well, I know I'm going to go back to this function through this return address, you've corrupted that tenant basically. And you're going to cause a crash because any uh, uh, exception or tr anything like that in the kernel, um, it causes a blue screen of death, right? So from an exploit perspective, once we've done the exploit work, we've smashed the stack, we need somehow to recover from that. Um, so what we can actually do is, um, uh, in the next slide, what we can actually do is we can append another ROP chain to the first one. So we call ZW open process to get a handle to the defender process so we can terminate it. Again, we have to do this in the kernel because it's a PPL. Then we can call ZW, ZW terminate thread, right? Again, we would do this in shell code normally, but we can't. We need to do it in ROP. So ZW terminate thread basically will pass in the handle to our dummy thread where we're doing this exploitation work, and the kernel will handle all the cleanup for us. So basically, we call whatever we want, whatever API, then we end that call in ZW terminate thread, and then that will gracefully um, resume, or gracefully terminate that thread. And here's what this looks like. So again, we call ZW, ZW terminate thread, which is a Windows API documented by Microsoft, which again, that's what attackers will use. And we flood the return address, or excuse me, we flood the stack with fake return addresses to call into this function. And then we resume the thread, which kicks off all the execution and eventually will um, perform the action we would like. So basically I've shown that we can do all the exploitation that we would like, but there's another caveat, uh, two caveats actually. So we can get a handle from the kernel using a kernel mode API call through a kernel vulnerability, and we can get that handle to the process we want to terminate, right? Um, but the issue is that handles are actually stored in a per process handle table. So if we think about this, we're doing this exploit work and theoretically an application called exploit.exe, right? When we open the handle to the defender process, where is that handle going to get stored? It's going to get stored in exploit.exe's handle table. But if we're getting a kernel mode handle, or excuse me, first I'll talk about, um, so yes, it's stored in a per process handle table. But additionally, um, Microsoft Defender registers some kernel mode callbacks, and what that is basically, it's a notification almost in the kernel that anytime some action happens, any entity that's registered a callback will get notified. Uh, for instance, there's a process creation uh, kernel callback. So anytime a process created, any application or driver, for instance, that registers a callback, it'll get notified, hey, this process was created. Well, there's one for object creation, which is what a handle is an object. And the defender process actually registers kernel callback tables that inspects anytime a handle is created. And anytime you try to open up a handle to defender, even if it's in the kernel, 
with the uh, necessary permissions to terminate the handle, it will strip the access rights. So you're not able to open up a handle to the defender process, even if you're doing it from a kernel mode API call um, in context of a user mode process, basically. Because the defender knows, hey, this is weird, this shouldn't be happening, and they're probably gonna try to terminate my process. This is an issue. One for the region I just mentioned, um, as we can see, um, we don't allow uh, handles to be open to that process with the necessary permissions. But the bigger issue as well is that the per process handle table, right? So even if we're able to open up a kernel mode handle, so there's a difference between a kernel mode handle and calling the kernel mode API to get the handle. You have to set some specific parameters to say, hey, this is a kernel mode handle, right? So let's say we were able to get a kernel mode handle. Well, remember, there's a per process handle table. All of the kernel mode handles are stored in the system process. We are in the exploit.exe process. So anytime we try to use that handle from exploit.exe, let's say we call terminate process to terminate the defender process. We have to pass in a handle to say, hey, here's the process we want to terminate. Well, exploit.exe has a handle table with all of its handles. It only knows about its handle table. So it will try to look up, hey, where's the handle that this user passed in? Well, the handle's a kernel handle, so it's stored in the system process, not in exploit.exe's process. So even if we get a kernel mode handle, it's stored in another process that our current process can't touch. I know that's a mouthful, but basically we can think of it as the kernel mode handle is somewhere else we can't access. So let's start with issue one. We can't do a user mode handle. So again, there's a difference between a kernel mode handle and getting a handle in context of the kernel. So in this case, there, when you call ZW open process, there is an object attribute um, structure um, which you have to supply. And within that object attribute structure, there is an attribute member. And there's a few values you can select, one of those being obj kernel handle. So when you call ZW open process, this tells the call, this tells the function basically, hey, we want this to be a kernel mode handle. So that's our first issue. We've completely solved that. And here's an example of what that looks like. Uh, we set the value here. So we have the kernel handle, great. Defender will, will not do anything when we open up a full permissions handle to that process in order to terminate it. But it's inaccessible from our current process because it's stored in the system process. So what if we could force our process to think it needs to look up the handle in the system process handle? Well, there is a way we can do this, essentially. Uh, there, the kthread object, which describes a thread, basically, it's the kernel mode's representation of a given thread. There's a member called previous mode. And what previous mode is, is it describes or indicates where execution, um, when you call a system service call, for instance, do a system call, it says where this call originated from. So if previous mode is set to one, this says, hey, this call came from user mode. Well, if, it came from, if it's zero, we say, hey, this thread originates from the kernel, essentially, or this execution. So we know we can leak kthread objects, so what if we could use our kernel mode vulnerability to corrupt this, basically? Why would we want to do that? Well, if we actually look at the, in IDA, the NT terminate process call, which is the syscall that happens as a result of terminate process, it captures our current thread and it captures the previous mode value and it uses those in an argument to this function um, called obp reference object by handle with tag. And what this does when we get into this function, uh, the ch there's a few checks. The first check is, is this a kernel mode handle? Well, obviously, yes, it will be. Then it does a test. It says, is previous mode zero? And if previous mode is zero, and if the handle is a kernel mode handle, the table we use to look up the handle is the OBP kernel handle table, which contains all of the kernel mode handles. So the TLDR on this basically is if previous mode is zero, the handle lookup is gonna happen in the system process. So we can, we can do this in our exploit, for instance. We can open a handle to the current thread, once we've got a handle to the current thread, which is going to do the exploit work essentially, we leak the kthread object associated with that thread. 
So now that we have the kthread object, we can use our kernel mode vulnerability to corrupt the metadata of that kthread object. And we can set the previous mode to zero. We can clear it out. And this kind of tricks the kernel into thinking, oh, this system call, terminate process, is originating from the kernel. Let me look up the handle in the kernel handle table. So here's how our exploitation looks like now. We would use ROP to call ZW open process to get a handle to the defender process. Uh, we then set up a second ROP chain after that call that calls terminate thread to gracefully exit from that thread. We also use the kernel mode vulnerability to corrupt previous mode to zero. And then using that same thread, we call terminate process. And when we call terminate process, using our kernel handle, the kernel will look up the handle, look up the handle in the proper handle table where it's stored, and we'll be able to terminate the process. So here's an example of um, what this looks like. Oh goodness! Oh, here we go. So in this example, we run the exploit. It's doing all the work we talked about, and on the right-hand side, uh, we can see that the process terminated. It, it went by very quick. Um, but basically, if we look at the results of the output of the exploit, we do all the things we talked about. We locate a stack address that contains our target return address. We corrupt it. We then open a handle using all of our vulnerability primitives we talked about to the defender process. We clear the previous mode and we let execution happen. Well, what happens when execution happens? We've corrupted the return addresses, so when they're executed, they'll return into our code. So basically, we're able to arbitrarily call kernel mode APIs even with HVCI enabled. Um, again, this is what shell code is normally used for, but we can't directly use it. We have to use some sort of other means, as we can see, very convoluted means. But it would have been, been much easier to allocate some executable memory, hijack a function pointer, call it, and then let all the shell code do it for you. We can't do it. We have to reuse existing code. So now let's talk about augmenting HVCI with control flow integrity, and these are the last few slides that I have, um, so bear with me here. What did our exploitation infer, or rely on? It inferred we could control the stack and flood it with fake return addresses, correct? Using a ROP chain. Well, there's a hardware mitigation now called Intel CET that makes this no longer possible. So Intel CET is known as Control Flow Enforcement Technology, and it's a hardware mitigation that basically protects the integrity of the stack. So what happens is, anytime a call instruction happens, which again, how do return addresses get on the stack? Someone called something, and that return address was pushed onto there, so when the call is done, we know where to return, right? That only gets pushed on the stack, but with CET, there's a shadow stack now, which is only accessible through hard, well, I guess it's accessible through software, but not directly, essentially. And it's a hardware stack, basically. And what happens is, anytime a return happens, the known good copy of the stack, which is not accessible from software, is compared with the stack currently, the normal software stack. And as we can see, if we corrupt the normal stack, but the shadow stack has the preserved copy, it sees there's a mismatch, and you, it will crash, basically. It's kind of like HVCI. It does a double check from a more immutable um, entity. Right? So, recall we had to use ROP because we can't directly execute shellcode with HVCI. So, basically, we had to find another way to do it using ROP. Well, that's not possible with CET. So the conclusion here is um, when you have a mitigation enabled, it usually needs to be coupled with another mitigation, right? So HVCI is probably the most powerful mitigation that Windows has. It's an amazing technology, but uh, it relies on some um, notions that you can't control flow hijack, basically. So we couldn't overwrite function pointers, we could overwrite return addresses. Well, when you couple uh, forward edge checks like calls and jumps and you also have CET to check the return um, control flow, when you couple that with HVCI, that will greatly raise the bar for exploitation because you basically force uh, people into data only attacks instead of corrupting or uh, hijacking control flow. So Windows actually only uses the shadow stack portion of CET. Um, so CET also comes with indirect branch tracking, which is also kind of like uh, control flow guard. It checks calls, 
But since Microsoft already has Control Flow Guard and a new and improved version called Extended Flow Guard, they only use uh, the Shadow Stack portion. So basically, Windows checks return addresses through CET and checks forward edge calls through um, the Control Flow Guards. Um, so you would need to basically bypass the Microsoft CET. CFG or uh, extended flow guard to keep a technique like this alive because you're not going to bypass CET um, that easily. Um, and your Windows machine has a lot of cool mitigations like this for free that greatly raise the bar for exploitation, so I would highly recommend that you uh, enable them. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you, and if there's any questions, I, I'm running short on time, but I'm happy to take them other uh, outside as well. Thank you. <laughs>